Good evening, all of you. Let us begin with the today's daily news analysis. Uh, that is 10th of April, 2023. So let's have a look at the today's editorial. So today we are going to discuss uh, two important topics. Uh, the first one is with respect to space age. It talks about the second space age. And the next uh, article is with respect to use of artificial intelligence uh, for smarter legislation, okay? So that is the use of artificial intelligence in the parliament, okay? Uh, basically streamlining the process of parliament uh, with respect to the lawmaking and all, okay? So that is uh, directing AI for better and smart legislation. But the main focus will be on uh, the first topic that is the second space age, okay? So let us begin our discussion with respect to the topic. So topic is important for, from your prelims perspective also. And the topic is important from the mains uh, point of view also, okay? So the uh, the name of the topic or the heading of the topic is uh, awaiting liftoff into the second space age, okay? So awaiting the liftoff into the second space age. The topic is uh, important for pre also and for your mains, it's an important topic for the general studies paper three, okay? So general studies paper three uh, with respect to science and technology, the development in the field of science and technology, it's an important topic, okay? So let us try to understand about uh, what are these space ages, uh, ages being highlighted into this article, okay? So I'll, the article talks about it's the a second space age. So first of all, let us at least try to understand what is the first space age, okay? So I'll just admit few more participants are there and then... Okay. Now, when I talk about uh, the first space age, the first space age began from 1957 onwards. Okay, so the first space age, first space age. There's a mess. Anything? Voice it. Voice is not here. Is there any issue with my voice? Am I not audible? Just check into it. Am I audible now? Hello. Is my voice clear? All right. Fine. All right. Yeah. So we are talking about the first space age. The first space age, uh, it began from 1957 onwards and it ended in 1991. Okay. Now, when we talk about the first space age, it was under the backdrop of Cold War, okay? So simultaneously, Cold War was going on. USA and USSR wanted to prove their superiority into the diverse fields, okay? And similarly, they even wanted to prove their superiority into the space field as well. And we see that the first space age, that is from 1957 till 1991, it was dominated by USA and USSR. The space age was formally inaugurated by USSR because USSR was the first country to launch a satellite. So with the, with the launching in 1757 of the satellite Sputnik 1, I'm very bad at writing spelling, so Sputnik 1, yeah. So 1957, the journey of the space age began by the launching of the Sputnik 1 by USSR, okay. Subsequently, the journey carried ahead. It was followed by cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin's entry into the space, okay. So cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, his uh, entry into the space was the subsequent uh, important Gagarin, yeah. Subsequent important event into the field of the space, okay. And again, he was from USSR only. Finally, this was followed by a big leap in the field of the space that was uh, by Neil Armstrong, okay. So we all know that the Neil Armstrong's, his historic mar uh, walk on moon, Okay, so he, he's, he was from USA. So these were the initial developments into the field of the space, okay? So formally, the space age was inaugurated by USSR uh, with the launching of the Sputnik 1. Then uh, uh, we had uh, Yuri Gagarin, Russian cosmonaut into the space, the first person into the space. And then we had the USA come Apollo mission with respect to the moon mission. USA was basically lagging behind into the space race. And because Russia was continuously, because Russia first launched Sputnik 1, then even the first uh, creature to the space that was dog Laika was carried by Russia to the space. Okay, He did not survive, he died. After the dog Laika, Yuri Gagarin went to the space. And America was way behind. So American president at that time, he said that, he fine, we will directly go to the 
satellite of Earth, that is Moon, and that was a historic success on the part of America. Okay, so the first space age was marked by the successes was marked by the dominance of USA and USSR, and the age came to an end in 1991. Now, what is the significance of the first space age? When I talk about the first space age, the developments were on the part of government. So government played a very important role into all the space developments, okay? Because all these missions were carried by the respective governments, okay? Now let us come to India. What was the India's progress into the space race, okay? So we are going to understand in the first space age and subsequently what is the progress of India into this entire journey, okay? So let us come to the Indian counterpart. So I'm clearing this part. We are now going to understand about Indian journey into the space, okay? So Indian journey. Now, uh, the very uh, first beginning that India did was in 1961. So in 1961, Indian National Committee. So we had an Indian National Committee for Space Research. I just admit, yeah. Indian National Committee for Space Research. It was chaired by Vikram Sarabhai. So this uh, committee in 1961 was extremely successful in launching the first research rocket of India research rocket okay now here we need to understand few important things this research rocket was not made by india as such it was given to india by usa okay so it was given to india by usa and the name of the rocket is nike i'll just write the name apache a p p a c h -E yeah nike apache research rocket it was supplied to us by usa but it was launched from india that is from the thumba equatorial research center Thumba Equatorial Research Center. It's in Thumba, that is in Kerala, okay? Thumba Equatorial Research Center in Thumba, that is in Kerala. Now, when I talk about research rocket, it is a sounding rocket or it's a research rocket. Rocket is basically the device, it's a carrier which carries the instruments, okay, to the space. So, we have just made the launcher. Launcher in the sense, this is not the true launcher in the face. This is just an experimental phase of launching carriers into the space, okay? So, Indian journey formally begins with this first step in 1961. Indian National Committee for Space Research. This was the committee operating under the Department of Space. It launched its first research rocket. Remember that the rocket was supplied to India by USA. The name is Nike Apache rocket. Launched from India, Thumba Equatorial Research Center, Kerala. Okay. Now moving ahead, the second important, and this was the two-stage rocket. Okay, two-stage. We'll understand about this the stages and all later on but as of now just remember this okay then the next is 1969 now the first rocket was given to us by usa the second progress is that we made our own experimental rocket okay the second progress is indigenously indigenously built research rocket okay and the name is rohini 75 so rohini 75 is the indigenously built research rocket of India, okay? And this was subsequently launched by India uh, from the same center, Thumba Equatorial Research Center, that is from Kerala, all right? So first one supplied to us by America, second one indigenously built by India. And many such Rohini series rockets were built. So these were experimental stage. India was doing an experiment with respect to how to make rocket, how to launch it into the space. All this experiment was going on. And the milestone, uh, the historic moment that took place in the country was that establishment of ISRO. So finally, on 15th of August, 1969, ISRO as an organization was established under Department of Space under PMO. So under PMO, we have, I'll write the organization over here. Uh, so we have uh, directly under PMO, we have Department of Space. PMO, that is directly under the control of Prime Minister and its Secretary. So Department of Space is there. And under this Department of Space, we have an independent organization functioning, that is ISRO, okay? So finally, 15th of August, 1969, ISRO as an organization was born. We know its headquarters, it's Bangalore. And the first chairman of ISRO was Vikram Sarabhai, okay? So the same person who was uh, heading the Indian uh, National Committee for Space Research, the same person was made the first chairman of ISRO, all right? 
So now we are going to understand after the formation of ISRO, what all progress took place in the country. So once again, the very first progress of country was the research rocket, but it was supplied by USA. Secondly, we built our own indigenous rocket, that is Rohini. These are rockets, okay? These are rockets which were built in India, that is the carriers to the space, okay? And finally, ISRO as an organization was born. Now, after the formation of ISRO, we built our own satellite. So satellite, it's, it is the one that is a device that finally rocket, that is a, uh, the launch vehicle. It goes into the space and finally satellite comes out of it. That satellite was made by India now. So after having a good knowledge of making rockets, research rockets, then we proceeded with the making of the satellite. Okay. So in 1975, the first successful launch that was of Aryabhatta. Okay. So Aryabhatta, named after Aryabhatta, uh, the ancient Indian uh, astronomer and mathematician. So this was the first Indian satellite. And this is the satellite. I hope the differences are clear. Research rockets are different. Satellite is different. Okay. And this was made with the help of USSR. Okay. So very successful thing made with the help of USSR. And one more thing, it was not launched from India. It was launched from USSR only. Okay. So in USSR, there was a place, Kapustin. From Kapustin, it was launched. Why not in India? Because still we did not have the technology to launch heavy satellites. Okay. We were not capable. Research rockets and all is fine. But launching heavy satellites was not developed into the country, okay? So we launched it from USSR only. So the first satellite of India, Aryabhatta, with the help of USSR, launched from USSR only. Then now, Indian satellites were now confident, sorry, Indian scientists, they were confident with respect to two things, that is building the research rockets, and also they were confident with respect to making of satellite, okay? Now, the most important project that took place uh, subsequently in India, that was in 1975 only, that is the site project. This is mentioned into this article. So, site is satellite instructional, instructional, satellite instructional television, television, this is television experiment, okay? Now, what is this uh, actual experiment, okay? So, basically, the experiment over here was that there was a lot of illiteracy into the country. So they wanted to uh, run a literacy program. They wanted to run educational programs into the villages of India. Okay, So 2,400 villages were covered. And on the TV sets, of, on the Doordarshan TV sets, they started launching educational program. That is imparting education. So this was started from 1979, a very important experiment that took place in India. And this was in association of ISRO and NASA. Okay, so ISRO and NASA, so NASA helped us into this experiment. So in 1975, two important things, Aryabhatta and the second important thing, uh, that is a site experiment, a satellite instructional television experiment. What is this program? Basically, in the rural areas, that is into 2,400 villages, we see that educational programs were being run into the country. Okay, so educational programs were run uh, in order to literary, uh, in order to provide the literacy to the people, okay. So very important thing that happened into the country, nineteen seventy five. Then we come to see the next important development that is nineteen seventy nine. In nineteen seventy nine, India made Bhaskar. Bhaskar one. Now what is Bhaskar one? Uh, Bhaskar one is basically remote sensing satellite. Remote sensing satellite. Okay, so remote sensing satellite, again, USSR helped us launching everything with the help of USSR only, okay. Now, for what purpose it was made? For the weather forecasting. Weather forecasting, the next important thing, it was uh, to uh, look after the, uh, to search for mineral deposits into the country, okay. So all these important things were done, deposits, deposits, yeah. So remote sensing, it's basically you are remotely observing the earth. Fine. Uh, so weather forecasting, mineral deposits that were being uh, uh, that were being looked after by this satellite. A very important thing, Bhaskar One Remote Sensing Satellite of India, again uh, built and launched with the help of Russia only, and also from it was launched from Russia only. Why? Because these are little bit heavy satellites. India was still not capable with respect to building of these launch vehicles to launch these heavy satellites. Okay, so it was done with the help of Russia only. Then in 1981. We had Bhaskar 2. It was an advanced version of remote sensing satellite, Bhaskar 1, again with the help of USSR only. And here, uh, the main focus was uh, 
ocean forecasting like looking after the oceanic resources and all weather forecasting so the remote sensing of the ocean area oceanic area was a focus over here okay so uh, these are the initial uh, important things of the country the next important satellite is your apple now what is the significance of apple now see up till now whatever we saw we saw aryabhatta as the first satellite of india but made with the help of russia okay ussr launched from russia only 1979 the site experiment with the help of usa that is nasa bhaskar 1 bhaskar 2 important remote sensing satellites again with the help of ussr so in the satellites up till now india did not make it anything indigenously right like we saw in the rocket the first indigenous rocket was rohini 75 but with respect to satellites nothing that was indigenous okay now apple is the first indigenous satellite of india first indigenous satellite made by indian scientists okay and this was however it was launched from french guinea so launch from french guinea Uh, that is in south america but uh, it was uh, made indigenously made by indian scientists okay so this is an important achievement that was again in 1981 only 1981 apple apple if you um, arian passenger payload experiment okay no need to remember its full uh, its full form just remember apple first indigenously built satellite of india okay launched from the french guinea so this is an important thing okay now after this so i am clearing this part we'll move towards the next part now after this the next important thing is insat okay so in in uh, insat yet uh, important uh, uh, event landmark event into the history of india that is indian national satellite so insat it's basically a series of satellites okay indian national satellite a series of satellites are there and insat was a big revolution in the field of uh, uh, telecommunication into the country okay a big revolution happened because this was able to provide television services and radio broadcasting services okay so subsequently many insat satellites were launched the very first one 1983 it was a insat ib satellite okay the very first one and subsequently many of them were launched okay so this is all about the initial uh, satellites being made and launched by the country now we are going to understand the launch vehicles okay no one thing we understood over here that ki though we were able to make the satellites but the problem with us was that we were not that capable in launching of these satellites we have to take the external assistance with respect to launching of these satellites okay now we are going to understand about the launch vehicles in india okay so let us quickly understand the launch vehicles i'll just share an image and hope yes so launch vehicles as you can see over here the very first one i'll just take it over here just a second yeah so the very first one launch vehicle is the basic launch vehicle why i am not able to right yeah so you can see over here small uh, slv okay so slv is the first launch vehicle satellite launch vehicle then aslv augmented satellite launch vehicle pslv gslv and gslv mark 3 will be understanding each of these uh, uh, things into detail i'll just share the white screen why i am not able to right Launch, yeah. Fine. So let us begin with the understanding of these uh, launch vehicles. Okay. So the very first launch vehicle is your SLV. Okay. So what is your SLV? Let us quickly understand this SLV. Again, the same issue. Just a second. I'll just figure out the issue. all right so let's begin with the very first uh, launch vehicle that is slv okay so slv that is your uh, satellite launch vehicle slv is the basic satellite launch vehicle and this was introduced uh, like developed in the country in 1980 okay so the development with respect to the launch vehicles it directly started from the 1980 onwards uh, slv when i talk about it was just 17 tons it's a launch vehicle 17 tons launch vehicle height was just 22 meters 
okay uh, 22 meter high 17 tons now what was it uh, capable to do so it was capable to launch the satellites that is the payload into low earth orbit now see there are different earth orbits so this was able to put the satellite in the low earth orbit now when i call uh, when i say low earth orbit so what is a low earth orbit it is from 160 kilometer to 1000 kilometer okay so this is called as a low earth orbit so if you are able to, so this satellite launch vehicle was able to place small satellites, okay, small satellites hardly with 40 kg weight, with 40 kg weight, so payload capacity was just 40 kg, so 40 kg weight and they were able to put this uh, uh, launch, uh, they were able to put the payload, that is the satellite was able to put into the low earth orbit only that is between the 160 kilometer to 1000 kilometer range okay so this is your satellite launch vehicle the initial phase okay after this you have augmented satellite launch vehicle now what is augmented satellite launch vehicle little bit better version of slv so what is this little bit better version now here they were able to put see what is the capacity of slv 40 kg satellite now this capa capacity was increased three times now the capacity is satellite of 150 kg could be put into the low earth orbit. Okay. Uh, no need to remember about the specification, how many tons and weight and all. So if it, if you want to know, 39 tons uh, was the weight of it and uh, its height is 23.5 meter. Okay. So height 23.5 meter, 39 uh, tons is the weight and it is able to put satellites of 150 kg into the low earth or orbit. Remember, low Earth orbit, 160 kilometer to your 1000 kilometer only, okay? So, these were the initial developments in 1980s. Now, let us come to the major development and all these were solid phases, okay? So, uh, the first one when I talk about it was a four-stage rocket. All the phases were solid. Here also, same, it's just advanced one, four-stage only and we have all solid stage. Now, we'll be talking about the landmark achievement that India to, uh, took, uh, that ISRO did was in 1994. In 1994, a landmark achievement that happened into the space field of India was the launching of PSLV. So PSLV was a landmark achievement of India. PSLV is actually called as work, uh, Workhouse of ISRO. All the important missions of ISRO, whether it is your Chandrayaan-1, whether it is your Mangalyaan, Mom, a mass orbiter mission, everything gets done with the help of PSLV. So PSLV, it's a landmark achievement uh, with respect to uh, ISRO. It was launched in 1994. Okay, now what is this PSLV? So first of all, understand that four stages are there and the stages are alternative. That is solid, liquid, solid, liquid. Okay, so if we talk about the earlier one, that is SLV and ASLV. The stages we saw that four stages were there, but all solid were there. Here, what is the significance? Alternative stage, solid, liquid, solid, liquid. Okay, so that is the first importance. Next, let us try to understand uh, how many, like the biggest advantage of this PSLV is the payload capacity. Okay, now first of all, we'll talk about the low earth orbit. In the low earth orbit, it was able to launch satellites with the weight of four tons. Four tons, that is, you can say, 4,000 kg. So just see the capacity. We started with 40 kg, then 150 kg. Now we were in a position of 4,000 kg, four tons into the low earth orbit, okay? Next is, after the low earth orbit, the next important thing is sun synchronous orbit. Sun, I'll just write it, sun synchronous, synchronous orbit. Now, what is the sun synchronous orbit, okay? So there is a slight difference between the, uh, between the two. When I talk about the low earth orbit, it is the low earth orbit and the movement is west to east, okay, like around the equator. When I talk about the sun synchronous orbit, these are polar orbit. So basically, you are moving in the north to south direction. So movement is north to south. That is basically you are crossing the north pole and south pole. That is the movement, okay. And sun synchronous, it means that you are synchronized with respect to sun. Now, what is the meaning of this? Now, first of all, let us try to understand what is the payload capacity into this sun synchronous orbit, okay? So, payload capacity of 1750 kg in the sun synchronous orbit, that is the altitude of this orbit was 600 kilometer. 600 kilometer altitude in the sun synchronous orbit. And I'll show you the image of these orbits as of now, just understand uh, the basic things, okay? 
uh, the uh, what is the function of this polar orbit sun synchronous polar this is sun synchronous polar orbit okay together called as so polar orbit in the sense the movement is of the satellite is how not to south pole okay this is the movement and sun synchronous means what the satellite is synchronized with respect to sun like for example today the satellite passed over delhi at 11 am tomorrow also it will pass over delhi at 11 am only okay so it is synchronized with respect to the timings okay so that is the meaning of this a sun synchronized polar orbit satellite and we were able to put it 1750 kgs of uh, payload into this 600 kilometer sun synchronized polar orbit okay now the third important thing of this pslv is launching of satellites into your geosynchronous and geostationary orbit Geosynchronous, geostationary, stationary orbit. Okay. Now, first of all, uh, yeah, what is the how much payload they were able to put it into this orbit orbit? Yeah. So they were able to uh, now this remember this geosynchronous or the geostationary orbit, they are at the altitude of 35,786 kilometer, approximately or 36,000 kilometer okay this is the altitude of your geosynchronous uh, orbit okay so remember this it's at a very great altitude okay second thing uh, when we talk about the payload so they were able to put one ton of satellite that is one ton that is thousand kg into this geosynchronous or the geostationary orbit okay now in this orbit now this uh, when i talk about this uh, geostationary orbit uh the basic significance of this orbit, when you say geostationary, it means what? It's, it is exactly in line with equator. In line with equator, okay? So basically, it is it moves across or it follows the path of your equator and it is geosynchronous. It is geosynchronous, that is, it is synchronized with the Earth. So whatever time Earth requires for the one rotation, this, the same time is required for that satellite for its one rotation around this earth, okay? So, geosynchronous, that is, it is synchronous with the earth. And stationary means what? It is in line with the equator. It is ex exactly in line with the equator. And what is the altitude? 35,000 kilometer, okay? Very high altitude. So, PSLV, please remember all the salient features of PSLV. It is able to put 4,000 kg satellite into your low earth orbit, able to put 1,750 1, kg in the sun synchronous polar orbit that is which moves from north to south and in the geosynchronous they are able to put one ton that is thousand kg of satellite okay uh, now this G, uh, PSLV it is called as workhouse of ISRO all the important missions your Mangalyan your Chandrayaan they are being done by PSLV up till now PSLV have done successful launches of 56 missions okay so 56 missions have been completed launch uh, missions have been completed by PSLV and uh, uh, talking about it is the most uh, successful venture of um, ISRO. Okay, so remember about this four stages are there solid, liquid, solid, liquid. Okay, uh, Vikas engine is the second stage. It's a special engine being uh, used in this. Okay, so in the second stage, this Vikas engine is used. So this is all about your PSLV. There are many variants of PSLV. Uh, Excel, then you have a DL, QL, no need to remember it, okay? After this, after PSLV, so I hope the PSLV is clear. We are now moving towards the last uh, phase of the launch vehicles, that is your GSLV, okay? So let us try to understand your uh, GSLV. Now, GSLV, it is mainly used for your, to putting the high uh, payload satellites into the geosynchronous orbit, okay? So that is, the 35,000, I'm writing approximately here. So, to put uh, to put the big, big satellites into this orbit, okay? So, we saw that PSLV. PSLV was able to put only 1,000 kg into this orbit, uh, 35,000 kilometer orbit. Now, GSLV, it's a special launch vehicle where it will be in a position to put the satellites of 4 tons. That is, you can say, 4,000 kg into this orbit, okay? That is a geosynchronous orbit. And when I talk about your uh, low Earth orbit, it is able to put 8,000 kg satellites into your low Earth orbit. And uh, yes, so these are the significance of your um, this uh, GSLV. Okay, so GSLV is the most important thing 
uh, just a second. I think so. this is GSLV mark. I've just uh, the stage. First of all, I'll write the stages. Three stages are there over here. So the first stage is the solid stage. The next is your liquid stage. And the third stage is your cryogenic. Cryogenic stage is what? An engine that uses fuel at a cryo. Cryo means what? Extremely low temperature. Okay. So the first stage is your solid. Second is your liquid. And third is cryo. Cryo means the engine here uses the fuel at a very low temperature. Okay. So that you need to remember. It is capable of putting, actually this one is capable of putting 2,250 kg into this orbit. Okay. 35,000 kilometers. Just uh, rectify this one. And 6,000 kg in your low uh, earth orbit, 6,000 kg in your lower orbit, okay? Further, GSLV ka advanced version is there, that is GSLV Mark III. And this is able to put your 4,000 kg satellite into the geosynchronous orbit, and it is able to put 8,000 kg satellite into the low earth orbit. Fine, so these are the different launch vehicles which are there into the country. PSLV we have completed, GSLV, Three stages are there, solid, liquid, cryogenic, okay? So, cryogenic, that is a fuel is a low temperature. So, basically, liquid oxygen, liquid methane, that has been used over here, okay? Uh, when we talk about uh, uh, this, uh, its speciality of GSLV, it is able to put high satellites, heavy weight satellites into the geosynchronous orbit, geostationary orbit, that is at 35,000 kilometer, 2250 kg, and low Earth orbit, 6000 kg. The advanced version of GSLV is GSLV Mark III, where it is able to launch 4,000 kg satellites into geosynchronous orbit and 8,000 kg into the low Earth orbit. So these are the different launch vehicles which are there with the ISRO. Okay, I'll just show the images of all the launch vehicles. Uh, sorry, all the orbits, so the things will be clear. So this is your uh, first of all. I'll show the yeah. So this is your uh, sun synchronous orbit. Sun synchronous orbit means I mentioned the polar one. So you can see over here, six, uh, 600 to 800 kilometer. And the movement is how? North to south is your movement, okay? So the movement is north to south. You can understand over here. The satellite is moving from north to south direction, okay? So that is the first one. Uh, the second uh, uh, one is, well, close this. So. The next one is your low earth one. So I'll share even that. Uh, yeah. So low earth is this one. You can see it is moving across the equator, west to east, okay? Up to the 1,000 kilometer, west to east, okay? So this is a low earth orbit. So low earth orbit, it is from west to east. So that you need to remember, 160 kilometer to 1,000 kilometer, okay? So that is your low earth orbit. Then the last one is your, the geosynchronous one. So the image of the geosynchronous one is this one. You can see geosynchronous one. Uh, its inclination is with respect to equator and you can see the altitude, okay, 35,786 kilometers. So these are the different uh, Earth orbits. You should be aware about all these Earth orbits, okay, and all the launch vehicles are extremely important to be known, okay. Now let us try to understand. Uh, the article further talks about the scientific missions of ISRO. So I, I'm just going to highlight the scientific missions of ISRO. We know about all these uh, missions of ISRO. I'm not going to go into the details of this uh, uh, missions of ISRO. So just we need to understand what are the uh, different uh, scientific missions under ISRO. So first of all, uh, when I talk about the historic, we, we had completed till INSAT, okay? At the end, we completed with INSAT. Now we are moving ahead uh, with respect to the other scientific missions of ISRO. So what are the other scientific missions of ISRO? So Chandrayaan-1. So Chandrayaan-1 was the yet another historic uh, just a second, I'll clear this that I'll be able to write. Yeah. So the scientific commissions of uh, ISRO. So the very first one, Chandrayaan one, that was being carried by India in 2008 with the help of your PSLV only. So very important mission, a highly successful mission of India. Then when we talk about after this, we had number of missions like we had Ocean Sat. Uh, these are different satellites with respect to rem remote sensing. Okay, Ocean Sat was there. Then we had Gagan. Gagan, like America has GPS, Global Positioning System. Uh, in the similar manner, we had this. That is uh, the geo-augmented navigation system made by ISRO and your uh, Airport Authority of India. So basically, it's a version of GPS, Indian version of GPS, okay? That you can remember. That is a Gagan mission of India, very important one. Originally, it was called as NAVIC. Then the first interplanetary mission of India, that is the Mars Orbiter mission. MOM, Mass Orbiter Mission, 
uh, that was uh, 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 this was also carried by PSLV. Okay, okay. So PSLV is the most important one that we should know. Uh, then the next is uh, the fifth mission is AstroSat mission. AstroSat. There was a UPSC question also on AstroSat. So AstroSat was a very important mission in 2015. Basically, the uh, the vision of this mission was to observe the celestial bodies from X-ray and uh, from UV spectrum. So in the previous session, we have studied this gravitational waves and the spectrums and all. So here, uh, basically, the, to observe the gravity, uh, to observe the celestial bodies from the X-ray and UV spectrum was the mission. Okay. Then the next important thing, Chandrayaan two, it was launched in 2019, but we know that the lander crashed, so it was not the successful one. Chandrayaan one, 2019. Your GSLV Mark Mark three was used. Okay. So we have just now understood what is GSLV Mark three. That was the launch vehicle it was used. Now we'll be ex understanding what are the expected missions of ISRO. So expected future missions are, first one is Aditya one, very important mission. Uh, this is um, expected in 2023. It's a solar mission, Aditya one, okay? So it's expected in this year. Next, we are expecting Chandrayaan 3. Okay, Chandrayaan 3 is also there. Then we have Gaganyaan, Gaganyaan. So Gaganyaan 1 will be launched in 2023, but it will be un. All right, let us try to understand the other high profile uh, missions of uh, ISRO, okay? So presently, yeah, as I mentioned that the very first mission is Aditya 1. Then you have uh, Chandrayaan 2 that is, uh, yeah, that is being there. After Chandrayaan 2, uh, the next mission that I mentioned that was your Gaganyaan 1. So Gaganyaan 1, initially it will be the uncrewed one. Uncrewed one, basically the crew, human beings won't be sent. Gaganyaan 1. Uh, it is expected in 2023 20, only, uncrewed one. Okay, so that will be done. Then you have uh, one more mission that is being planned by uh, ISRO, that is your uh, Shukrayan. This is also a very important mission, Shukrayan. Shukrayan, this is ISRO's mission to Venus. Okay, so this is planned by ISRO. Remember this, uh, ISRO's mission to Venus, that is your Shukrayan. Okay, Shukrayan, it's planned by ISRO in 2024. Then again, you have MOM, Mars Orbiter Mission, Part 2. Already one is being done. So, MOM 2 is also being planned in 2024. Okay. Then you have, uh, yeah, one uh, in between here, Gaganyan 2 is also there. Gaganyan. So, Gaganyan 1 and Gaganyan 2, they will be uncrewed ones. Okay. Both the thing, first they will verify whether we are able to put it into uh, space. Uh, demos will be undertaken and then it will be the crew will be sent. Okay, so first two will be uncrewed ones. Shukrayan, remember it's a mission to Venus. MOM 24 is being planned. This is Mars Orbiter mission, second one. In 2024, this is being planned. Then finally, you have Gaganyan, crewed one. Okay, Gaganyan 3, that will be a crewed one. And this is somewhere expected around 2025. Okay, and then the yet another important mission is Lunar uh, Polar Exploration Mission. So lunar polar exploration mission, India is planning this again in 2025, okay, lunar polar exploration mission. So these are all the high profile missions of ISRO in the upcoming years. And you should know about all of them because in prelims, they may, mainly, you know, the focus is on science and technology. So you, we should be aware about all this happenings. Okay, so Aditya 1 is expected, Chandrayaan uh, uh, 3 is being expected, Gaganyaan 1, 2, subsequently later on Gaganyaan 3 will be there. Shukrayan is there, MOM2 is there, and Lunar Polar Exploration Mission is finally there. Date is not announced for this, okay? Now, uh, when I talk about ISRO as an organization, subsequently it has grown into a big research organization of India, highly successful organization of India, with 14,000 scientists working. And year by year, India's budget is increasing with respect to space, okay? So when, when we talk about Indian space economy, as of now, the spending is... 9.6 billion dollar was the spending in 2020 uh, this spending increased to uh, 13 billion dollar 13 billion dollar in uh, 2021 uh, this was the spending in 2021 and subsequently it is expected that india will be spending around 60 billion dollars by 2030 okay into this space technology and research. So this is being highlighted into this article by 2030, our spending will be around 60 billion. Okay. So this is about the first phase. 
first space age. Now let us have a short discussion on the second space age. The second space age is the age which is dominated by the private sector. Okay, so from 1991, this space age started, and second space age, it is mainly dominated by private sector. Now, when I talk about private sector, we all know that SpaceX that is being there into this SpaceX by Elon Musk. Okay, it is dominating these days. So literally earlier. All the major satellites were being launched by uh, government-owned institutions like NASA, ISRO. But now we are seeing that the last year we had 80 launches. Out of this 80 launches, satellite launches, uh, uh, 60 of them were by SpaceX. So now we are seeing that the role of private sector into the space. That is the second space age. Okay. The next is a very high-profile project of the SpaceX only, the Starlink project. So Starlink project, Starlink, it's basically a consortium of satellites, okay? So uh, literally there are 3,500 satellites providing internet services and billion, millions of dollars, uh, millions of subscribers, uh, they are paying for this uh, internet service, okay? So this is a Starlink, it's an internet project providing uh, internet uh, with, and this is again the SpaceX, uh, the SpaceX project, okay? Uh, the next important thing is your, uh, this, uh, uh, one web one web is the uk based company uk based company so this is also an internet service provider company launching its own satellite okay so uh, this is again a very important company and now recently we have a, a jeff bezos that is of amazon so he has announced his project so please remember uh, his project as well that is project quickware okay uh, project Prepare and this is again an internet project, internet connectivity providing project by the founder of Amazon. Okay, so please remember these projects at least. Uh, Starlink of SpaceX, One uh, One Web. It's a UK based. These are all internet providing, internet connectivity providing projects. Okay, and Amazon project is their project prepare that, that is again internet providing, internet facility providing project. Okay, so nowadays we are seeing that. Uh, uh, these private sectors are playing an important role. We often hear about the space missions where the common citizens, by providing, by giving crores of rupees, we will be given a, a space journey. All this is being financed by these private companies only. What about India? Do we have um, these private companies? So India, as of now, we, we talk about, so this is on the global level. Second space age in India, uh, ISRO definitely is supporting the private companies. Okay, so we have, many startups okay hundreds of startups are there in this um, space uh, field and isro is basically providing the framework to all these startups okay so in india isro is helping the startups with respect to this second space age but if we talk about the companies like we have the global companies like spacex and the amazon uh, head uh, investing like that investment we do not have by the private sector okay it is mainly which is done by the government but still isro is trying to help the private sector okay so that is being highlighted into the article apart from this now you should know about uh, the certain uh ventures under isro so antrix we all know that antrix it's a mini ratna company mini ratna company it's a commercial arm of isro okay so remember this it's a commercial arm of isro so basically what um, ISRO does it, so we have so many developing countries, okay, so we help them to launch their satellites, okay, so it's a commercial, commercial arm of ISRO providing remote sensing facilities to the other countries and all to the private sector and all, okay, so that is established in 1992, it is under ISRO, okay, now recently we have new companies also that is new, uh, new space India limited, new space India limited headquarters, it's in Bangalore. Okay, a very important company under ISRO, uh, under department, uh, this is under Department of uh, Space, okay, New uh, Space India Limited. Now, when I talk about this company, this is also trying to provide services to both foreign and domestic players, okay. So, both foreign and domestic players, it is trying to provide services. Which services we are providing? We are providing them satellite launch services, okay, especially PSLV and SSLV. Now, what India is doing, India is making money with this PSLV and SSLV. So developing countries, if they want to launch their satellite, come to India, use PSLV, give us a certain amount, depending upon the weight of the satellite and all. So basically, 
with this so is trying to incentivize itself okay so that is an important thing that has been happening over here and we have in space in space this is also an autonomous company under the department of space only a new separate body and it is basically it is acting as an intermediary between isro and private sector intermediary between isro and private sector okay so remember all this these are the recent developments new space india limited in space okay in the recent years not immediately but in the recent years and you're also so in space it basically uh, providing the technology isro ka technology to the private sector it's being done over here okay so uh, these are the important uh, things under isro fine uh, what is the organization setup uh, so we have already seen that we have under pmo there is a department of space under department of space isro is there and then all all these companies are there antrix uh, your a uh, new space india limited and your in space these are under the department of space okay and they are trying to in incentivize commercialize the technology of isro so that's it about this uh, topic uh, this topic talks about the two space ages the first one and the second one just remember that the first space age was financed by the governments and uh, usa and ussr dominated in india isro played a very important role into the first space age and in the first space age what did we study uh, the entire uh, funding came from the government uh, hand holding okay let us discuss uh, the last uh, article for the day and that is directing ai for better and smarter legislation okay so what is the context of this article so the article says that artificial intelligence is nowadays attracting the attentions of entrepreneurs political leaders policy makers around the world okay and we are seeing that the more and more uh, democratic countries they are making the use of artificial intelligence in order to enhance the functioning of their democratic uh, institutions especially using uh, ai in the functioning of the parliament so first of all what is ai so we know that artificial intelligence it's basically it is based on machine learning it is based on machine intelligence which is um, opposite to the intelligence of human and the other animals okay so basically we are using the machines for enhancing our lifestyle that is called as the artificial intelligence okay uh, now the article talks about uh, the use of um, artificial intelligence in law making so article says that the artificial intelligence tools can actually help the parliamentarians in preparing their responses with respect to the questions for enhancing the research quality for obtaining any information regarding any bill preparing the drafts of the bill okay for amendments so basically the parliamentarians and the law makers they can have uh, they can use this artificial intelligence tools in order uh, in the process of the law making okay uh, so what are the challenges which are there into this artificial intelligence okay now if the indian parliamentarians they want to use uh, artificial intelligence with respect to digging any information with respect to uh, doing a quality research first of all we need that entire codification of the law is being done into the country okay so first we want that all the information should be there into the digital format it should be be there into the digital domain then and then only ai can do the research and ai can help us uh, to get the, the data so codification of the laws is extremely important step okay if we want to use ai in the law making process so has india done it to yes india had issued india code portal so what is this india code portal it's a step by indian government in order to codify all the legal system all the laws all the ordinances all the amendments supreme court verdicts high court verdicts everything it's being codified and that is the india code portal okay so the work is going on once it is successful definitely we will be in a position to use ai into all these uh, issues okay uh, into the uh, law making process apart from that ai also has a capacity in order to find out uh, citizen grievances so it can be used for identifying citizen grievances Uh, it can um, uh, dig into the social media and look into the grievances of the people so it can look into the comments into the social media articles into the social media and understand ki if there is any dissent into the country grievances of the people okay so that could be understood by this artificial intelligence tools okay when we talk about the world wide framework so different countries are using this artificial um, intelligence platforms okay for enhancing their uh, 
work like for example in usa we have a framework so uh, when i talk about the global scenario the article talks about the frameworks into the different countries okay so like uh, in uh, in usa in us parliament artificial intelligence is being used for uh, analysis of bills of the amendments then when we talk about dutch that is in netherlands also uh, they have speech to write artificial intelligence tool in order to convert text into voice and also voice back into text okay in order to facilitate easy process of law making text into voice and reverse vice versa then talking about japan japan is also using artificial intelligence tools in order to receive responses and make different laws brazil even that is using so brazil has a system uh, ulysses and uh, this supports citizen participation and transparency okay now when we talk about india uh, in india uh, we have um, national e vidhan portal national e vidhan portal now what is this national e vidhan portal so basically they want they want to make the legislative process completely paperless okay so national e vidhan portal it's it's an important uh, initiative it's a demo project that is being um, uh, going on into the country and the concept over here to make the functioning of the legislative assembly okay completely paperless so whatever as of now the documentation and all that happen it happens in the paper format and all so now they want this is a, uh, they want to make it a paperless assembly under the digital india program okay so that is one mission that has been going on into the country and slowly and gradually uh, we can uh, like it's a pilot project slowly and gradually it could be covered into the different parts of the country so this article basically talks about the use of artificial intelligence in the law making domain okay that's it for the day thank you so much bye bye good night